This morning's session represents a yearly event when we welcome new members to the research school. The research school has been in existence since 2011, and we have established something of a tradition in making this opening of the school year an occasion to debate an important theme relative to the status of peace in today's world. Last year, we considered the question, what is the gravest threat to world peace? And the responses, as you, as you might imagine, were diverse. Although, interestingly, two of the panelists, there were four, maybe there were five last year, well, two thought that a nuclear confrontation was the most dangerous challenge on the horizon. Subsequently, I will note, uh, the research school organized a course on the political, legal, and moral dimensions of nuclear weapons. The research school is an academic consortium that provides courses and skills training for doctoral students. It is intended to be a forum for discussion of the most advanced issues in peace and conflict research. The school is a joint initiative of PRIO, the University of Oslo, and NTNU. Membership in the school is based on a competitive admissions process. To qualify for membership, one must be enrolled in a doctoral program and be in the early stages of writing a doctoral thesis relevant to peace and conflict. This year, we have admitted 21 new members, under, just, just under half of the number of people that applied for admissions. Uh, I've heard that 17 of the new members are present today. So I'd like to just a hand to the new members of the research school. Welcome. Pardon? Yeah, please raise your hands. Great. Good idea. We'd originally thought about having you come forward and say a few words about your research, but I'm, I'm afraid if we did that, you know, the would stretch out a little bit longer than, than we, you know, the time allotted. Uh, the school is multidisciplinary, with members and lecturers coming from a variety of disciplines, including political science, sociology, history, human geography, law, philosophy, and anthropology. The school is becoming internationalized, with students drawn from Norway, of course, but also Scandinavia more broadly, Germany, Italy, Turkey, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, to name just a few of the countries that have been, been represented. I've already noted that membership in the school is restricted to doctoral candidates. However, the criteria for course enrollment is somewhat more lenient. Depending on available space, MA students have been admitted for courses as well as qualified professionals who are working in the fields of conflict management, development, et cetera. About today's topic, I think it is safe to say that the annual conferral of the Nobel Peace Prize has become the main occasion in which the theme of peace is reflected on and debated by people across the globe. It is truly a global event. Our human understanding regarding the nature of peace and our expectations concerning its achievability does not remain fixed and stable, fixed and static. And this fluidity, if I may call it that, this fluidity in our understanding of peace and our expectations for how much peace can be achieved this fluidity is reflected in the long history of the Peace Prize. Ever since the first Peace Prize was awarded in 1901 to, who was it awarded? Okay, I won't put you on a quiz. To Henri Dunant and Frédéric Passé. Maybe it's Passé? Passé. I didn't know it was awarded to the second name person until I checked Wikipedia 10 minutes ago. All right, but I, I had heard about Henri Dunant as the first awardee. Now, 
it is inevitable that the Peace Prize would give rise to controversy. This is, in fact, a good thing, as the nature of peace raises challenging questions about human existence in society and questions about which there can be no simple answers. The debates have naturally, that, uh, debates have naturally arisen regarding the criteria set forth in Alfred Nobel's will. And you know, people have discussed how, how well the awardees fit the criteria laid down in his will. But our focus today is not on the interpretation of Nobel's will, uh, which is at bottom a legal and historical question. It's rather on the broader societal good that the Peace Prize aims to serve. It is beyond doubt that this societal good stands as the main objective of the prize. Beyond the yearly grant to the year's honoree, I would call this the proximate beneficiary of the prize, all right? Beyond the yearly monetary grant to the, yearly, the, year, the year's non honoree or honorees, uh, I would say that the ultimate beneficiary of the prize is society itself. This is fundamentally what the prize is about. How well is the prize promoting the good of this beneficiary? society. That is a subject we will discuss together this morning. And in this connection, I'm pleased to have with us four eminent panelists. We have Ulav Nielstad. I hope I said your name right. It's, it's a tough one for a, a native English speaker, uh, an historian director of the Nobel Institute, and secretary of the Nobel Committee. Then we have Ostri Sukke, who is an anthropologist at no, the, no. oh, you're not. OK, please. I should have asked you before. OK, thanks you. I'm, my, my apologies. Now, that ruins things, because I thought we had a nice diversity up here. So, but OK, well, you can't have everything fit in a nice package, can you? Um, then uh, and uh, Ostri Suka is is a uh, is at the Christian Mikkelsen's Institute in Bergen. Thanks very much for coming this morning all the way here. Then we have Evan Ustrud, who is a professor of political science at the University of Oslo, and we have Christian Berg Harpviken, uh, sociologist, who is uh, the director of Prio. Uh, all right, since I've mentioned disciplines, I myself uh, am a philosopher by training. We have a few other philosophers here, Henrik Sisa and Christof, Christopher Lidean, who, who uh, is the academic coordinator for the research school. So uh, we'll begin now with comments from our panelists. And um, Ulav, you'll start, will be the first to speak. Thank you very much. <coughs> Let me start by <coughs> excusing myself. I have an acute eye problem, uh, uh, and to make worse, things worse, I also forgot to bring my reading glasses with me, <laughs> uh, so I can barely see the notes. Um, but I should, should know the texts. Anyway, well, we have been asked three questions, and been asked to, to, re to relate to those questions, um, uh, so I, I will take them one by one. Uh, and the first question you raised was, in what ways, if any, is the Peace Prize of real importance today? Uh, and we see from time to time that people claim that the prize has lost its relevance. It has become more or less irrelevant to the real questions of our time, the real challenges of our time. And we see other kinds of criticism, of course, of the prize, which I'm sure we will have a chance to, to come back to. Uh, still, I will claim that the prize has some importance. In what ways? Well, first of all, we can see that the number of nominations 
are steadily increasing and actually increasing very fast. Which indicates, I think, that there is an interest out there in the price. There are people believing the price is important. So this year we had 376 nominations for the Peace Prize, which was, was almost 100 more than the previous record. So it's really a very fast increase in nominations. And we also see that the media intention, attention is larger than ever. This afternoon I will have a meeting with CNN. They're coming here to discuss whether they can take a, a, a larger role in, in broadcasting um, <coughs> events in December. So there is an increasing international media attention. And we also see on the web that more people are seeking information about the Peace Prize than about any of the other Nobel Prizes. So visitors to the website of the Nobel Foundation, and there are millions of visitors, uh, most of them are seeking information about the Peace Prize. So those claiming that the Peace Prize is irrelevant has to re explain this interest. Now, of course, the fact that many people take an interest in the prize does not prove that the prize has any impact. That's a different question. And I think we sh should be careful not to exaggerate the potential impact of the prize. It is, after all, only a price. The important is mainly symbolic. But still, I am personally convinced that the Nobel Peace Prize also has impact, also is important in various ways. Generally speaking, I think the most important impact of the prize is that it helps the world address the issue of peace and war. It stimulates an ongoing discourse on a very, very important topic or set of topics. The causes of war, the prerequisites of peace. And every year, this debate is stimulated by the decisions of the Nobel Committee, Norwegian Nobel Committee. Many times it will create controversy. I think that's a very important aspect of it. Without controversy, the prize is in danger. Moreover, many former Nobel Peace Prize laureates have testified that receiving the prize did change their life, did put them in a much stronger position to promote their causes. So the prize is offering the laureates a microphone. It may help open closed doors. It may even protect people. Aung San Suu Kyi would probably have been in great personal danger had it not been the fact that she was awarded the prize. Andrei Sakharov may not have survived. At least he would have been in great danger of being put in a prison camp, not only in internal exile in the Soviet Union, had it not been for the protection that the Peace Prize gave him. Finally, I think the best proof that the prize has importance, real significance, is the response 
by people and governments to the decisions of the Nobel Committee. When the government of China reacts the way it did, it is not because the prize doesn't matter. It's not because the Nobel Prize is ir irrelevant. It is because somehow the government of China <coughs> believes that the prize to a political dissident in their country is a challenge. The second question you raised was whether the peace prize is moving in any specific direction. Uh, I think in an historical perspective, there is little doubt that the peace prize has developed over the years since the first prize in 1901. And I think at least four important developments have taken place during these more than 100 years. First, up until the outbreak of the First World War, the Nobel Peace Prize, almost without exceptions, was awarded to people and organizations that either was part of the international peace movement or at least supported some of the main causes of that movement. For instance, arbitration. It's hard to find any laureates before the Second World War, which does not fit into this pattern. After the First World War, and again after the Second World War, the Norwegian Nobel Committee gave a number of prizes to people and institutions working to build a better organized and more peaceful world. More specific, people supporting the League of Nations. And after the Second World War, people and institutions associated with uh, the United Nations. And most likely, the Norwegian Nobel Committee has looked upon these international organizations as some kind of permanent peace congresses, which is, of course, one of the three main criteria uh, written down in Albert, uh, Alfred Nobel's will. A third important development is the inclusion of human rights and democracy work in favor of human rights and democracy. Uh, and we see, can see from the early 1960s onwards that many awards have been given to this kind of work. And the committee obviously sees work in favor of human rights and democracy as a way to strengthen brotherhood between nations. And the fourth very important development is the globalization of the Peace Prize. It started out as a prize awarded to elderly white men from Europe and North America. The first prize to a person outside that area was given only in 1936 to a South African diplomat. But it was only in the 1970s, I will think, you can really argue that the prize becomes global. And in the last 20 years, far more prizes have been awarded to people outside Europe than within Europe. The third question was, what should be the balance between the main concerned, concerns addressed by the Peace Prize, fraternity, disarmament, and peaceful cooperation, or peace congresses? Have some of these been neglected? 
has the committee remained within its mandate? I think what Alfred Nobel did was to give us three kinds of piecework that was, in his mind, of equal importance. There is nothing in his will suggesting that any of these three criteria was more important than the others. I know there are people claiming the opposite, but I disagree strongly. And if you look at the program of the peace movement at the time, you cannot really argue that any of these, fact, any of these criteria was more important than the others. Some would obviously say that disarmament was the most important people at the time, but others would have different opinions. It's very fascinating to see how diversified, how complex the peace movement of the late 19th century really was. And we also know, of course, that Alfred Nobel himself was not the member of the peace movement. He had very close friends within the movement, but he stayed outside. And he had, on every issue, a very independent mind. Uh, so I think the committee is right in considering these three criteria as three guidelines. And it's their job to find people who have done excellent, important work either in all these three kinds of peace work or at least in one of them. And this is how it should be. Uh, some will argue that these three criteria are part of a kind of organic peace theory. But it's hard to find any proof <coughs> supporting that view in, you won't find it in the, in the will, of course, but it's also very hard to find uh, evidence that this was how uh, Alfred Nobel looked upon it himself. I think he wanted the prize to be relevant and to be stay relevant over time the prize has to be dynamic. The understanding of the prize cannot be made once and for all. So I think I will leave it Thanks. for that now. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm grateful that you read the questions that we set forth. Uh, they, they were in the announcements, many of you have seen, but it was good to have them uh, reiterated. Our next speaker. Uh, Um, yeah, I also read the three questions, and I thought with 10 minutes and three questions, that's not going to work. So I picked one, and I picked the middle one, uh, but I reinterpreted it, and I didn't discover that until now, because the text says, this is like interpreting Nobel's testament, the text says, is the Peace Prize moving, or should the Peace Prize be moving in any specific direction? Well, I thought that was maybe a bit to bland, so I reinterpreted it to mean moving in the right direction, uh, because then we have a question we can address. Uh, and thinking about this, I landed very much where Ula is, that it depends not only on your vantage point, but over the years, the laureates have, uh, the choice of laureates has reflected different understanding and evolution of understanding of the nature of war and peace and the pathways to peace. Uh, and this is natural then that the Peace Prize reflects the evolving, shall we call it, the international discourse on pathways to peace, which has uh, changed over time, this discourse. Um, and I want to, to illustrate that, to develop a bit the periodization that Ola uh, had. This is based on a very interesting article by an American legal scholar, Roger Alford, who wrote an article in Virginia 
International, Virginia Journal of International Law in 2008. And he said uh, the question he proposed to, to pursue was to what extent and in what ways has the Peace Prize contributed to the development of international norms regarding uh, war and peace. So he had a legal perspective, but the analysis, but legal perspective, but the analysis is interesting. Um, and he starts, as you did, uh, with the pacifist period in 1901 to 1913. But using pacifist in the original meaning of the word, namely the abolition of war, and the argument was based on uh, the tragedy of war. It wasn't based on you know, those who received the Peace Prize at, at the time. It was based on an emotional appeal to the tragedy of war. And therefore, we should not regulate war, but we have to abolish it. Uh, so you had a number of pacifists who represented that perspective, who received the prize from 1901 to 1913. Then in uh, the next period is what we call the interwar period, that is between World War I and World War II. Um, and here, this he calls the statesman period. And here the argument or the discourse that was rewarded with the Peace Prize was that we need to regulate war by appealing to the reasonableness of law. Uh, not the emotions and the tragedy, and we cannot abolish law, but we can regulate it, and we can develop law to, to, to regulate war so that it is more humane, so to speak. Uh, this was the period of pacting, international peace pacting. Uh, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, the Locarno Pact to stabilize frontiers in Europe. Uh, so it was a different approach to uh, the question of how do we deal with, with wars. There were also in this statesman period two interesting sub-stories. One is specifically to make war more humane, and this is the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which in 1917 received the Peace Prize, the first out of three, I think, all. And also Fritjof Nansen got it for the passport, which was the first step to regulate uh, and give, recognize the rights of uh, refugees with the Nansen passport. The second sub-story is particularly interesting today because it was given to the dissident. And this is the first dissident in the, Nansen, uh, in, in, in the, in the Nobel Peace Prize history, and that is Karl von Osiecki in 1936. And as you probably all know, uh, he received the prize for revealing publicly state secrets in his newspaper, or the newspaper that he wrote for. <laughs> so it is a very topical. But the consequences for poor Osiecki was, uh, in Germany in 1936, he was declared an uh, enemy of the state, and he died in concentration camps soon thereafter. Uh, then after the war, um, we have the humanitarian period. Here, the development is not only roots of the, war, the laws of war to regulate uh, you know, weaponry, the so-called hog basis, uh, but particularly international humanitarian law to protect civilians. Uh, and here we have ICRC is getting its second uh, Nobel Peace Prize for the development of, or its role in the development of the Geneva Conventions, and UNHCR which was established in that period and did so much to address uh, the problem of refugees in Europe after World War II. Um, then we go into the human rights period, 1960 to the end of 1980s, according to this periodization. Uh, human rights advocates and dissidents from Africa, from what was then the Soviet Union, uh, Mother Teresa, Elie Wiesel, Amnesty International, all lined up. Uh, but the sub-theme is interesting because we have in this period also the pragmatic statesman. This is Kissinger and Le Docteau for uh, ending or negotiating an end to the Vietnam War. And we have Anwar Sadat and Begin as well. So you have these two very interesting different themes in that period. Then in the 1980s, uh, 
what he calls uh, this author the democracy period. And then we have Dalai Lama, etc. We go back to Manchu, uh, and we have Shirin Ebadi. And now he stops there, uh, and it seems a reasonably tidy and quite interesting uh, periodization. But he missed the environmentalists. And the first, I don't know, I can say it. I, I was on the, on the committee, we were on the Oslo committee, of consultants that uh, developed, or we wrote assessments of the sh candidates on the shortlist uh, for the Peace Prize. And the first year I was on the committee, uh, the, an African, a Kenyan woman, uh, Bangari Matai, who was mostly famous for planting trees in Kenya, she received the Peace Prize. And that Peace Prize <laughs> generated no end of discussion and controversy, both uh, in the media and uh, we had even a special seminar was uh, organized afterwards to say, you know, what has this got to do with peace? Uh, so it was a very lively introduction for me to the work on this committee. <laughs> but I think, uh, again, reflecting what uh, Ulla was saying, I think it is good. I mean, the prize should generate a discussion uh, on, uh, on, on evolving understandings of uh, the nature of, of peace and pathways to peace. So I thought it was actually quite, quite fun. Um, and quite, quite correct uh, in that sense, in this broader sense. I have three, three <coughs> points to make in reflection to the right directions and where the Peace Prize might go. Uh, first, uh, the periodization that I just mentioned, that is, of course, uh, mostly evident in retrospect. And you can see the broader lines of history, and you can see the evolving discourse. If you look more closely, and if you read Gary Lundestad's book, you realize that there are all kinds of subplots in this story uh, that influence uh, the decision to choose one rather than the other candidate. For instance, uh, in uh, 2003, it was clear that Shirin Abadi uh, got extra marks because she was a Muslim. And it was important, as uh, it was noted in the presentation of the prize, <coughs> that at the time when Islam is demonized in most of the West, it's important that we show that we give the prize to a Muslim and a woman at that. Because this was just after the invasion of Iraq, and uh, it was, uh, in that sense, an important symbolic uh, signal. Uh, and then there was an emphasis, we need more women. So at one point, even three women together got the prize. Uh, and when, after that, the, the prize had been very controversial at one point, the committee seemed to sort of withdraw and sort of let us avoid controversy and find a safe, <laughs> easy candidate this time. And I think we saw some of that last year. Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion about interpretation of the testament. Uh, and there are purists and textualists in this debate, as there always are. Um, I'm not a purist. I'm not a textualist. I think if the price is going to continue to be relevant, it has to be a living price. It has to be a contribution to the discussion and to the discourse and understanding of pathways to peace. Um, but I also wonder, this is my third and penultimate point, um, if the increasing visibility of environmentalists uh, in the mid-2000s, you got three laureates in quick succession, 2004, 2000, 2007, may be connected with the fact that it was difficult to find someone actually working for peace in the more conventional sense, uh, even though there seemed to be plenty of conflict. Um, now, finally, let me return to where I consider a right direction might be at this point in time. Uh, and that is going back to the theme of the prize in the past as having been important in contributing to norms uh, in regulating uh, methods and means of warfare. Uh, the prize has a strong tradition in this uh, area. Uh, the landmine treaty, the organization promoting that, got the prize, uh, atomic weapons, chemical weapons. So what is the weapon of choice now 
that many people say really needs to be regulated that has not been regulated in the same ways and that is proliferating. And that is, of course, drones. Uh, now, that is interesting um, because the argument is that with drones, uh, war becomes much less costly for those possessing the most advanced kinds. Uh, therefore, it tends to facilitate and increase the risk of war. That's one argument. Secondly, because technology is not really rocket science, uh, it's not very difficult to develop uh, now, the working drones. There is a significant risk of proliferation, and therefore you need to regulate that, uh, because otherwise you have uh, undermining of the international system of, of, of order, such as it is. So in the solid Nobel tradition, I would uh, nominate someone or an organization that is looking at the issue of drones and how to regulate them, and if, if they could be regulated. Uh, and uh, the problem is there aren't very many <laughs> working in that area. There's a UN Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial, arbitrary, and summer executions who has engaged himself in that. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, one might have to look a bit. On the other hand, as Olaf also mentioned, that is precisely the function of the prize to underline and accentuate, to put the spotlight on emerging areas of concern and give those working to increase regulation in that area and extra push forward. So I'll end there. Thanks very much. Mm. Well yes, thank you so much. Hey, <coughs> um, I, should, I, should, I think I should tell you that my, my direct connection to the, to the Nobel Peace Prize is that I have been an official advisor to the committee for several decades, longer than I care to remember together with uh, Helge Faro, he's also, he's also here. And uh, Astrid, for some of the period, I have, uh, I have written about 125 uh, reports on major candidates, nonviolent dissidents, uh, statesmen and negotiators, human rights advocates, uh, democracy champions, humanitarians, pacifists, media and fact finders, quite a wide range. Uh, and uh, the idea about the reports is not to have an opinion about uh, whether the candidate deserves the prize or not. That's for the committee. The idea of the report is to specify the character of the work, uh, the type and extent of the qualification, and uh, leave the judgment for, for the committee. Uh, you, should, you should also, it, it's also quite crucial that the Nobel Peace Prize is not a scientific prize. If it, if it has any resemblance with any of the other P Nobel Prizes, it's probably the prize in, in literature. It's, it's, very dis uh, it's very different from, from the scientific prizes. In the end, it's, um, it's a question of political judgment for, for the prize committee. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, Francis Seierstedt, who was a professor of history and a um, long-time member and chairman of the Nobel uh, Peace Prize Committee, uh, used to say that um, this task is impossible. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, therefore, it's very challenging and interesting for an academic. But it is impossible. Uh, the prerogative of the committee is also to interpret the mandate, to interpret Nobel's testament. Um, uh, thank God, I, as, as an advisor, uh, the mandate is not my headache. And it never was. That's for the committee. Uh, the scientific prizes, basically, uh, is not for ongoing work. There are some exceptions. Moser and Moser is probably an exception. It's not, but, but usually, it's not for ongoing work. It, it uh, may be given for achievements uh, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, which deserve notification in hindsight. And the the, um, it, it's also meant as a stimulation for, for science and scientists. If you work very hard, you might even get the Nobel Prize sometime in the future. Not so for the Peace Prize. If you work very hard for the Peace Prize, 
it would probably be, be completely counterproductive. <laughs> and, and you are disqualified, probably, for getting the price if, you sort of, if that is your sort of explicit, explicit uh, uh, aim. Uh, Nobel wanted to make a difference. <coughs> and that is, that is the, sort of the crux of the, of the mandate. Um, organizational peace conferences, as you said, reduction of standing armies. It's very concrete, it's very measurable at the time. Uh, but it was also one very general and open clause, fraternity between nations, fraternity between nations, quite open, open for interpretation. What, what would that mean in, in uh, 1901 or 2016? Um, probably quite different things. Uh, making a difference, how does the Peace Prize do that? Uh, it, could, uh, it could sort of uh, single out um, past very specific event, the Vietnam War, Kissinger, Ludwig Thor, uh, Israel, PLO, uh, certainly in the, uh, in the early 1990s, both very contested. Make it last is probably one of the messages in, in these types of prizes. Uh, make it last, make, make the Vietnam peace last, make the PLO-Israel um, uh, agreement last. No, they didn't, none of them. But that was probably part of the message. Uh, it could uh, influence ongoing work. Continue with this. We don't know what, whether you succeed or not, but it's uh, important work. Continue with this. Uh, Médecins sans frontières, certainly, who got the prize. Uh, the campaign against landmines. Uh, the idea was not to uh, make world peace. Uh, doctors without borders don't make world peace. But it's very useful work, it's humanitarian work, it's very useful. It deserves a price, continue with this. Uh, the, a ban against landmines, it doesn't end war, but it might change the norms, it might change the legal sort of framework, and therefore it's useful. It, it's useful. Um, it could also, uh, it could also be, no, no, um, uh, yeah, uh, it could also be the case that that um, uh, it signifies a hope for the future uh, from political nonviolent dissidents to Barack Obama. A hope for the future. Uh, you, you haven't achieved much yet. Uh, you have made some very uh, useful speeches. You have talked about uh, multilateral cooperation and, and the prospects of, uh, of global peace. Uh, but you haven't achieved much yet. But it is a hope for the future. Barack Obama got the prize on, on that basis. And some of, the, some, of the other, some of the other prizes are also of that kind. Uh, the effect of this, uh, well, one immediate effect is that it makes the laureate famous. It sort of puts a spot <coughs> on, on some specific kind of work and makes the proponent for that type of work famous. Uh, partly rich also, but, but basically famous. S somewhat rich and, and famous. Um, does it have any effect on world peace? Well, you, you should have a fairly idealistic uh, theory of, uh, of conflict and international politics if you thought that the peace price really could affect world peace to, to any noticeable extent. Marginally, perhaps. Uh, occasionally, yes, perhaps. Uh, again, doctors without borders, marginally, uh, some sort of, yes, it helps people in the conflict situation. Doesn't promote peace, but it helps people in the conflict situation. Again, uh, the, the, my, my second example, um, the campaign against landmines. Yes, if there is a legal ban, it might have some effect. It might sort of dampen some of the work to develop landmines in, in some countries. It doesn't stop conflict, but it might have some positive influence in the conflict situation, even if peace doesn't follow. The controversial prices, the really controversial prices, um, are raising a debate. And, and that is one of the ideas about the price. It's raised a debate. As, as Francis Sayers had said, it's impossible to give this price, but the debate might be fruitful. Um, it hardly moves the critics of the most controversial crisis. They're not moved at all. 
If you look at, if you look back at the debate, the critics are not moved. The critics of Henry Kissinger, when he got the peace prize, no, oh no, uh, the peace prize was wrong, <laughs> but it didn't move them. Certainly, uh, the P the peace prize to Gorbachev, in in the Baltics and and in Russia, oh no, oh no, they got even more sort of vehement in the critique of Gorbachev in the aftermath of, uh, of, of Gorbachev as a Peace Prize winner? Certainly, certainly not. Al Gore, Al Gore when, it was, when, when he was sort of uh, accused for, 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 uh, for twisting on the facts in his film, and, and this was sort of a lot of, and he, and he had, a, he had a, what did he have? He had a, uh, a, a, an enormous house with an enormous amount of electricity at work. For in his uh, in his uh, bathtub uh, outside, and, and this sort of this was this was ah this is a stark contrast between his personal life and what he sort of preaches off publicly, and and that didn't stop. No, on the contrary, the the, the price sort of uh, uh, aggravated that kind of uh, that kind of critique. Um, also, certainly Obama, also certainly Obama, when he gave his uh, his talk. Some of us were present when he gave his talk. It was an argument for, for, um, for the just war. It was a just war argument. That's what he did. In Afghanistan is a just war. And he made an argument for that. Uh, the critique didn't stop, certainly. Uh, the European Union, uh, in the midst of the worst crisis in, in the history of the European Union. <laughs> uh, and, and some critics, I remember, I was, I was, when this was made public, I was in France. I was in Paris when, the, when, when it was made public. And some of the parliamentarians said in, in, in the, in the uh, Strasbourg or, or, or the European <coughs> Union Parliament said that, yes, this is excellent. We have always said that this is a contribution to peace. Uh, the other argument made by, by French parliamentarians was that, oh, this is turning the thing on the head. It was the peace and the Cold War who was a prerequisite for the European Union, not the other way around. And, and they continued saying this irrespective of the, of the price. So the debate has not been dampened by, by, by a peace price. The controversial price is, yes, useful, uh, heated debates, but, but uh, the peace price really sort of was, was, uh, was oiled to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, to the flames. Uh, as I said, it is a political price. It's subject to political disagreement. Uh, as Olaf said, it has basically symbolic value putting sort of the, the, the light on, on, on an important spot in, in world affairs, basically symbolic value, uh, even if the effect, the real effect on world peace is, is, is small, if noticeable at all. And now it happens, uh, Asri, that I have also quite recently read um, law professor Roger Alford's uh, oh, really? work. Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, how could that be? <laughs> uh, it's, quite, it's quite interesting, it's quite interesting, quite long, quite interesting. Uh, and he, as, as Astri said, he, he enlisted his periods, basic periods, up to the First World War, the pacifist period, as he called it, uh, various types of pacifists, uh, the period between the wars, the, the, the statesman period, basically you're quite right, it seems fairly, fairly well taken, uh, 1940s, 1950s, uh, humanitarian period, uh, human rights period uh, up to the mid-1980s, and then the democracy period uh, after, as a final one. And I, 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 I tend to agree that, yes, this fits the history fairly well. It fits the history fairly well. And I also agree with the basic, the sort of basic message of this. The basic message is, uh, as, as he says in his subtitle, the Nobel Prize Prize laureates as norm entrepreneurs, as norm entrepreneurs. And the changing profile of the Peace Prize during this, this period, these 115 years, uh, is basically a mirror of the times. It's a mirror of the emerging norms, the basic norms in international affairs, even if the price doesn't change the norm to any considerable extent. It's a mirror of the norms. Uh, and it raises a debate which is an interesting, interesting, quite important debates uh, very many times in the, that, that, that's sort of, that's part of the mystique of this price, that it is so, it's so immensely uh, high standing. Um, at the same time, it's criticized so strongly. It's very heated debates about it, and that is one of the sort of, that is part of the mystique of the, of the Nobel Peace Prize. So it's, uh, 
since I have uh, since I have been an advisor for for three and a half decades, uh, that's worthwhile uh, achievement. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much. I should add, I didn't know analysts were advisors, <laughs> so you weren't picked. In um, yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I didn't know. Um, uh, fourth speaker, are you are you an advisor also? Okay, well, good. <laughs> Christian Berghoff, you can. Thank you. Uh, most of you have already addressed my experience with the industry. Uh, no, I have never given advisory before that position. And there's no better reason for that for me than as an advisor to uh, offer my presentations everywhere and be interviewed with the best providers in the world. You're disqualified because of that. Uh, Aren't you pretty good? Yes, no, because of the high <laughs> price prices. Uh, my In the case, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. about the interest in human rights. And of course, uh, there is an irony in this too, because uh, if you look at the media cycle surrounding the prize, uh, there is enormous interest in the run up to the prize. There is some <coughs> interest in the immediate aftermath of the announcement, and then the interest declines uh, relatively significantly. Which I guess is a microcosm of how the media works more generally. Uh, there's a lot of interest at the time when we know very little. And there's a lot, there's very little interest at a time when we know much about the background and can have more intelligent discussions. And those of us working on conflict know this dilemma firsthand. Well, I have the dubious, um, the dubious uh, honor of having been listed by foreign policy a few years back, admittedly, in 2012, <coughs> as responsible for one of the 10 worst predictions of the year, uh, listed <laughs> alongside uh, Barack Obama, who had said something about the end of nuclear uh, armament, and Angela Merkel, who had spoken out on the end of the economic crisis in Europe. But even if I was in, uh, in good company, of course, that made me ponder about the value of the, uh, of the predictions. I can actually blame this on Stan Tennyson, who is present, my predecessor as a PRIO director, who started... But, but, but started Stein, Stein, Stein is now an advisor to the committee, so, uh, so there he, is hope. So he, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, the point, of course, in uh, engaging in the predictions is very much to stimulate exactly the kind of debate that we have here, uh, a debate uh, about what uh, the Peace Prize should be about, uh, about where it should go. So uh, read up on the predictions. I'm not going to focus my comments here today on, on, uh, on those. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, widely recognized as the world's uh, most important prize. Uh, as several of my uh, co-panelists have already pointed out, <coughs> measuring the impact is uh, not only a demanding, but perhaps even uh, an impossible exercise. But if you really think that the prize is uh, important, uh, we have to be able to say something about the impact. A lot has been said uh, already. One way of thinking about the impact of the price is that the price does something that uh, changes the global agenda when it comes to peace and conflict. Uh, the tallest ambition would be the price that the price is earth shattering. I think several of my co-panelists have indicated that that may be a little bit too tall of an ambition. But um, at the very least, the prize should uh, regularly award individuals or organizations that have <coughs> truly uh, done something innovative, truly contributed to redefine the way in which we understand peace and conflict, the way in which we understand what it is that contributes to make the world a more peaceful place. And that is already a very tall order. And the committee's problem, of course, is that not only must it have an opinion on what the important issues of the day are, Austria referred to, the, to, the, to drone warfare as uh, a significant disarmament challenge in the present world, but as Austria's comments also indicated, it's not <coughs> enough to have an issue. You actually have to have an can a candidate that carries that issue. Uh, and I think Austria illustrated very nicely how it is that uh, the hunt for that candidate may be quite a difficult one. Now, a side reflection on that issue is, in fact, that the, um, the people who are currently most vocal in fighting uh, drone warfare and seeking international regulations on the use of drone warfare or 
uh, related category, robotic warfare, are to a large extent the very same people that were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their fight, for the, for their, their fight against landmines back in 1997. So you may in fact widen the understanding and say that the price to the landmines campaign in 1997 was not only a price to those <coughs> who were fighting a particular issue, it was in fact a price to a new way of conducting a disarmament campaign in which civil society actors organized transnationally outside of the normal multilateral arenas, the UN and so forth, and effectively managed to change their arena. Now, the puzzle is, of course, why is it that similar activism seems to be less successful today? Uh, the world has changed. Uh, it's hard to envisage that the landmines campaign would have been successful in today's political climate. That uh, happened in the immediate aftermath of the uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, it was a very different political climate. There was wide agreement that the Security Council, just to take one little indicator of how the climate was different, Today, perhaps, uh, what we need is an entirely new form of disarmament activism in order to be successful. Now, there are a number of critical debates surrounding the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Some of those debates are substantial, and they have been touched upon uh, extensively by several of my co-panelists. Some are more procedur procedural. And uh, the procedural uh, debates are important. They may seem uh, formalistic, uh, but they are important because ultimately the very procedures that underpins the process by which the price is decided upon is the foundation for the legitimacy of the price. Now, of course, the decisions themselves do matter for the legitimacy of the price, but once critical questions start to be asked, the procedures also matter. And one critical question that has been asked is the simple question as to whether the price committee is independent. Um, the price committee is appointed by the Norwegian parliament. That is a given because that's exactly what uh, Alfred Nobel asked in his will that the Norwegian parliament, the Storting, should do. But he did not specify how. And the way it happens is that the uh, uh, presidency of Norwegian parliament takes uh, the meat weight, weighs the different uh, party delegations on the parliament, and distributes the seed according to the weight. Uh, that means that uh, one temptation for all politicians is immediately to uh, use a seat on the Nobel Committee to uh, reward uh, long-serving politicians for true and faithful service to the party rather than to look for those who have the deepest interest or the best competence on the very issues that the committee is um, set to, um, to guard. Uh, I have been critical of that. Uh, others have been less critical. Uh, perhaps the most uh, famous of all Nobel Peace Prize historian, Erwin Abrahams, uh, has been a defender of the same principle. He would say, uh, it's a good thing that uh, the Norwegian Parliament appoint the Nobel Committee. Norway's politics is always a little, little to the left <coughs> of uh, global domestic politics and global, global uh, mainstream politics. And that's exactly what we need in order to find the right balance between uh, provoking and uh, being within the confines of what uh, resonates with uh, leading politicians. A second type of procedural question is simply whether the committee is competent. Uh, and there is a connection between that and the question about whether it's independent, but not necessarily a close one. We have here started to discuss uh, the concept of peace, how it is changing, how the Nobel Committee and the prizes that it's award is uh, challenging us on how it is that we understand what contributes to peace. Those are, of course, as those of us who spend our entire lives working on those issues, very, very challenging questions. Uh, and it's not obvious that uh, any politician have a good grasp of the underpinnings of that. I agree entirely with, uh, with Eivind that the prize is uh, a political prize. It is not uh, a scientific prize. But even in order to have competent judgment on the substance of these issues, you need at the very least, as a politician, to have had an extended interest in them and a lifetime engagement with them. And for those of us, and I belong amongst them, who have uh, also been critical of the appointment of committee members on this particular count, I think we can take it as, 
a minor victory that uh, several of the last appointments made to the committee, I'm thinking particularly of the Labour Party's appointment of Erit Reis Andersen and the Conservative Party's uh, appointment of my colleague uh, Henrik Syse, is in fact an admission of the way that competence matters. These are appointments that are a very far cry from earlier appointments of people who have shown very little interest in the issues but have, uh, have been faithful party members. Then of course we're moving on to the third type of criticism which is uh, uh, at the heart of much of what's been discussed here today and that is really whether the prize is awarded for the right purpose. Uh, Alfred Nobel's will, as we've heard, can be interpreted <coughs> in a number of different ways. The term fraternity between nations is not all that clear. The abolition or reduction of standing armies, well, that's conventionally taken to mean disarmament. Uh, others would say it means uh, pacifism, but there are a number of possible interpretations also of that term. And then finally, the holding and promotion of peace congresses. Now, does that mean peace congresses in the very way in which they were formatted in the late 1900s when Alfred Nobel wrote his will? Or does it mean international order and multilateral cooperation in entirely general terms? Those are the extremes of the possible interpretations of that uh, one-third of the pur purpose that um, Alfred Nobel spelled out. It's not self-evident. But we certainly see that the concept of peace has changed. Uh, in recent years, we have uh, seen the extension to the environment. Uh, Wangari Matai was uh, mentioned. We got a little insider's uh, glimpse of the uh, expert opinion that uh, uh, underpinned that decision. We, had, uh, we have had prices for conventional economic development, if you want, with the prize to uh, with a prize to uh, Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank, which was awarded in uh, 2006. Also a prize that was quite extensively criticized <coughs> by many who thought that the underlying, underlying theory of change, the uh, underlying idea of how it is, or what it is that contributes to peace, was uh, a poorly founded one. But we certainly have seen that it has stirred controversy. Now, it was indicated here also that last year's prize to the uh, National Dialogue Board it was sort of a retraction from a committee that now felt that there had been so much criticism of its decisions that it uh, should go for a safe bet. Now, I happen to think that the National Dialogue Board it was one of the most, most worthwhile winners in recent history. Uh, it was also innovative in that it cast its light on the importance of national dialogue, the collective effort of people with uh, different opinions, different interests coming together to uh, uh, help a country and a people get through a crisis situation. I thought that was very important. But of course, what I'm disappointed with is the fact that despite the importance of the price, there is no controversy, hence also very little debate. Uh, it's probably the most quickly forgotten price also in recent history. So if you believe, like me, that this is possibly the most important prize in recent history, but also the most quickly forgotten prize in recent history, then we have a problem, of course. Uh, it's not only because of the lack of controversy. I think also a major factor in Gay Lundestad, the uh, Olaf's uh, uh, predecessor as the secretary of the committee through 25 years, uh, very clearly says in his recently published book in Norwegian that uh, Having a face on the prize is essential to stirring interest. <coughs> and having four faces, uh, like you had with National Dialogue Board, does not give it uh, that, uh, that type of uh, poster. So that is, uh, that is a big dilemma for the committee. And I must say I was very surprised for rather trivial reasons that, that we have had now in four years three organizational prizes being fully aware of fact, uh, of course, of the fact that uh, the Nobel Committee is sensitive to maintaining the interest of the prize, and that it's been said by many observers of the Peace Prize, and I think many of the members of the committee, both present and previous, would agree to this, that the prize's ability to really stay there uh, and remain respected as possibly the world's most important <coughs> prize hinges on this fluctuation between picking out the unknown candidates 
and then using candidates, using individuals and organizations that are well known to shine a light on the prize. Uh, these are my words, but I think that's what it's about. That alternation has been absolutely essential to the status of the prize. Now, perhaps in passing, we should think a little bit about what the issues and the future directions may be. Um, and I promise to be short, and I probably already overstepped my commitment to be short, so let me at least try to do that very briefly. Uh, again, 15 years back, on the 100th anniversary of the prize, uh, the previous secretary, uh, Gail Lundestar, wrote uh, a reflection on where the prize, uh, how the prize had developed and where it was going. He there indicated certain future trends that he thought were likely. He pointed to, for example, artists or celebrities becoming possible prize laureates. We haven't really seen that happen. <coughs> we haven't seen any bonus, bonos or certain Saren, Saren, Sarendons <coughs> receiving the prize. Lundestad also pointed to the importance of media and important independent reporting. We haven't seen Al Jazeera or BBC or, for that matter, the uh, mysterious Anon operating in Ghana and the, on the African continent receiving a Peace Prize, much as I think most of us uh, are convinced of the importance of independent reporting for our ability to maintain peace. We haven't seen that. Currently, on top of my list, is Edward Snowden, a very controversial candidate, of course. And here again, the independence of the committee uh, becomes an issue, because for uh, a committee composed of uh, politicians that represent mainstream Norwegian politics, to award the prize to a person who our closest allies see as a national traitor is uh, a, a long step to take. Uh, other issues, corruption and uh, economic equality, I think are really issues of the day. Peace for crime. So we could hmm? see anti-corruption fighters, we could see people who do innovative things in order to promote economic uh, equality. Not only are those big debates, but they are debates which are possibly getting even <coughs> more important as uh, we speak. Uh, and then I also think it's remarkable that uh, the whole big area of uh, transitional justice has not really been awarded with a Nobel Peace Prize. And if you were uh, an expert or an activist on transi transitional justice, you would probably see that as a failure. This is one area where there has been massive institutional level uh, innovation over the past 15 to 20 years transitional justice courts or other mechanisms for dealing with, uh, with uh, the misdeeds of the conflict in its aftermath have now become a staple of peace processes. Even so, none of these candidates, not the International Criminal, Co Criminal Court, none of the state-specific courts that have been set up have been found worthy of receiving a Nobel Peace Prize. And I think that gives reason to think. And then, of course, uh, we have current issues. The migration and refugee issue is one that quickly comes to mind in a European context. Uh, but if you look at the price of those uh, nominations that have been confirmed this year, and nominations are not all confirmed, but we managed to pick up some, uh, then you will see that that is an issue that figures very extensively on the list of uh, confirmed nominations. Finally, peace research. Peace researchers have often been uh, proposed as candidates for the prize. Perhaps again, it's uh, a reason to think that this is testimony to the failure of peace research, that uh, none of our colleagues have been uh, found worthy of a Nobel Peace Prize uh, so far. Uh, we will see what the future brings. Uh, one of Prio's founders, Johan Galtu, is quite uh, frequently figuring on the list of possible candidates. There are uh, a number of uh, other uh, candidates from that field. Uh, I still don't think it is very likely. I may think there are good reasons to look in that direction, but uh, I expect that the prices we shall see will be rather within some of the other areas that I was just discussing, rather than uh, the prime occupation of the very institute in which you find yourselves today. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Four panelists. Before opening up to questions from you, uh, the audience, I'd like to know whether any panelists would like to make a quick comment on 
what the other panelists have said. Yeah, Ivan. Yeah, I would like to. to have a, quick, a couple of quick comments to, to, to Christian's um, intervention because I, I, I think they, they sort of highlighted some of the crucial issues. Uh, first, I would say that the, the, the Tunisian dialogue price for the four Tunisians was to a very great extent a purely symbolic price. It was a symbolic price for so sort of, yes, the, the, the Arab Spring is very important. Uh, there is one single country that, where the Arab Spring might have, might have had some positive effect, that's Tunisia. Uh, let us give the price to some Tunisians because this, it, this was so promising. It went so badly in most countries uh, with, with the partial exception of, of, of Tunisia. Um, and I think that was purely symbolic. It didn't, it didn't really have any effect in, tu in, in Tunisia. That hardly, hardly. <laughs> I can't see that. But it was sort of, it was a message uh, at the time. As you said, uh, quickly forgotten. Uh, secondly, for the, for the Norwegian parliament. Uh, yes, they use the meat weight. I'm, I'm not going to defend this very strongly, but, but I can see the reason for it. The reason for it. Uh, it is an expression of the fact that this is a political price. No one is neutral. No one, there is, there is no expert without any, any sort of um, uh, objective idea of what, what leads to, to, to peace. It's extremely controversial even among experts. Johan Galtung, Johan Galtung among, among peace researchers, is extremely controversial. Uh, certainly, all, all peace researchers are. Who, who do you choose? They're, they're, this is a political price. It's a political choice. Even among the researchers, it will be a political choice. And the Norwegian parliament know that. They know that, that this is a political price. And, and they know that no competence is above politics in this respect. Um, yes, good judgment. Uh, that's crucial. Um, interest, yes. Knowledge, yes. But in the end, it is a political choice. And the Norwegian parliament know that. And therefore, they use what you call the meat weight. Occasionally, they, they, they are lucky with, with a very good choice, I agree. Francis Seierstedt, as I, as I mentioned, um, and, and, the, and, 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 the, and the two recent ones, which you also mentioned, one of them was here, is here, uh, maybe? No, he, he was here before the meeting, yeah, fine. He's there, fine. Yeah, he is, <laughs> very good, <clears throat> um, but, 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 but still, it is, it is a sort of, it based on uh, what, what, the, what the parliament think is their sort of, their political lenience, uh, certainly. And, and, and that's, that's crucial. So, uh, yes. And that, so, so there are very good reasons for, for, for the system. I, 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 <laughs> but would you like to respond to this, Christian? Well, I can respond very briefly. Uh, you know, I, mean, I happen, I'm one of those who happen to think that if I hire an architect, I want to know whether the architect actually is also a carpenter, uh, that, the, that the architect actually knows the craftsmanship. Mm. Uh, and a politician who has devoted his or her ultimate career to domestic issues, I don't think has the necessary knowledge to competently use his or her judgment on these issues. Agreed. And that has been problematic yeah. with some yeah. of the appointments yeah. on the committee. Sure. So sure. I don't I think agree. we disagree fundamentally No, no. I agree. Ultimately, mm. it's a matter of political judgment mm. that we agree on. Yeah. But to ha offer sound political judgment, you need to know what landscape you're in. Definitely. Yeah. I agree. Yes, uh, I also would like to comment a bit upon uh, what even um, also Christian said about the political nature of the price, which I fully agree of, of course. Uh, and this goes back to Alfred Nobel's will. We often get the question, why Norway? Why was Norway picked to award the Peace Prize? And many people are very... Uh, occupied uh, from this very interesting. I think that's the wrong question to ask. <laughs> the interesting question is why Stortinge? Why a parliament, being it Norwegian or Swedish? That's the, that's the clue. Uh, that, that tells us that Alfred Nobel was looking, wanted to make sure that the Nobel Peace Prize Committee understood politics and would be dynamic. 
because the members would be reappointed by a storting which is elected every fourth year with a possible renewal of its composition. So in that way, it became <coughs> sure that uh, the committee would understand politics. Had he wanted, he could have asked a peace organization provide the peace prize. He stayed away from that. That would be a very um, obvious thing to do if he really meant that the organized peace movement was that's where the, the, the best understanding of, of issues of peace and war was found. But he moved in another direction. He wanted it to be appointed by politicians. Um, so I, I think this was, this was a conscious choice. He wanted politicians, not scholars, not peace activists. That being said, the committee is, of course, free to seek the scholarly advice it wants and does so. So we have excellent advisors, both Norwegian scholars and international scholars. The best there is. I don't think we ever has received a no from an international capacity being asked to give his advice to the committee. So, uh, but does the committee take the advice? Well, that's another matter. <laughs> but they have they have the the expert opinions, uh, and they can can go back and ask and dig for more information if they want to, and they do that every year. So, I th in my view, this is actually quite a good um, good thing to to have this committee as a mixture of. Uh, politicians, other civic society representatives, and some scholars. Also one remark about the National Dialogue Quartet. I disagree that this is a e uh, quickly forgotten prize. We will receive a parliamentarian rep uh, group of, of uh, Tunisian parliamentarians coming to Oslo now. They are enthusiastic about this. They, they, they feel that this prize was very important to them, to the recogni recognition of the role of civic society for peace building in general. And it helped commit people and decision makers in Tunisia, commit them to a peaceful course, which it was not obvious. And it still isn't obvious. So in that sense, I don't think we have seen the full importance of this prize yet, because the situation in Tunisia is precarious. Uh, Austria? Okay. We'll now open up for questions and comments. Uh, in order for as many as possible to speak, I, I'd ask you to avoid tripartite and binary questions. Keep yourselves to unitary questions. It may be possible to come back later with an additional question or comment, but keep it to one at the outset. I know that Christopher Lidayen already has manifested that he would like to ask a, a question or make a comment, so we can let you go first, Christopher. Uh, we'll take three to begin with. Uh, yes? And OK, I've got two here, all right? And then we'll, we'll, we'll do it, at, continue after. Thank you very much. Thank you for very, uh, very interesting uh, introductions. Um, first, to, to organizational comments. Uh, so first, uh, there is lunch afterwards, as you might know, and you're all very welcome, uh, also if you didn't register. So uh, it's scheduled until one o'clock. Uh, second, um, the, also this discussion session is being uh, filmed, so if you uh, take the word, you tacitly consent to also being filmed, and we will eventually post it on the website of the research school. Okay, so that's the organizational. Uh, in terms of substance, uh, we're now living in the most peaceful times of uh, centuries in terms of 
war between states, as uh, prior researchers, amongst others, have uh, documented. And the question then is what do you do in such an immensely uh, peaceful uh, time? Do you uh, widen the scope and focus on imperfections of peace? Or do you retain the focus on war between states uh, in order to prevent the uh, future uh, wars between states, perhaps even worse wars than the world wars that we have seen? Um, I think you could draw a connection between several of the prizes in the categories of uh, democracy, human rights, etc and war between states as well. But that's not the dimension of those prizes that have been emphasized here. Uh, perhaps the emphasis on relevance that several of you brought up is going in favor of the broadening. Because in the time of peace between states, the focus might not then be on war between states. So what seems relevant might lead to uh, ever widening of the scope of the prize. And I'm wondering what, is, uh, what does peace congresses actually mean today? What's, what is a peace congress in the contemporary con uh, context? And how could that be reflected in, in the future prizes? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just say my name. Yes. yes. I'm Mai Bente Bonvi. I am a grandmother for peace. Our big worry in that organization is the second criteria, standing army. What about the monster of the military industry? I think it is very little discussed upon. And uh, uh, Astrid Sirke, thank you for uh, talking about the drones, norms on the drones, but that's only one thing. I think the whole troll of the military industry must be debated much more. And so I'm so happy because Ingeborg here gives me the Congress of IPB in September, disarm as a demand, <laughs> disarm for a climate of peace, three days on this IPB in Berlin. September. <laughs> so I'm I'm lacking the discussion on the big monster. Yeah. Ingeborg Bremes representing the Nobel Peace Prize of 1910. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it, it's it's um, obvious that the International Peace Bureau uh, would like established at the time by Inter Alia Bertha von Suttner to coordinate the work of the, at the time, very strong national peace movements and still a network of peace organizations. And uh, of course, for us, the peace movement, the international peace movement, it's important that the peace prize focuses on the root causes of war and the ongoing militarization. So we would love to see more on how to build a culture of peace, how to, um, how to get rid of the upcoming and ongoing arms race and the Cold War uh, rhetoric. So I won't say more on that, but, but we would like uh, to see that happening. And, and thank you for the insightful presentations that you have made. And I was thinking, Olav Njölstad, when you say that um, it was the parliament that was picked, but if, it had, if Norway hadn't been important at the time, they would have picked normally the Swedish parliament. So why did they pick the Norwegian parliament? I think we were small, peaceful, beautiful, maybe able to come up with alternatives that a bigger uh, country would not be able to do. And now we are growing into a middle uh, uh, strong military power. So the Nobel Peace Prize has to be even much stronger 
in its anti-militarism, since it now is in a country that cannot claim anymore to be the peaceful, beautiful country of Norway of uh, 1901. Uh, oh, yes, please. Yes, we can maybe start with Austria. Yes. yes. So I think uh, I think this is very interesting because uh, Christian mentioned where is the so, where is the civil society activism for peace. Uh, and it, he doesn't see it today, but I think if it has to be a grandmother generation, <laughs> that is the moment yes. for this. I think that is, that is very important. <laughs> uh, you are a model for a younger generation in this respect. Um, I wanted to pick up on Christopher's point. Uh, I think it confuses a bit the issue to say a distinction is relevant here, or wars between states, or wars within. Uh, because if you take uh, the approach, which I did in, in my talk, uh, on the emphasis on regulating means and methods of warfare, equivalent to in international law, use on velum and, and use in velum, then of course that applies both to international and to non-international contexts. Uh, and, uh, so, so there's plenty here to work on. You don't need to, to say, we need to widen the, the price uh, scope in order to address conflict within states, clearly not. All right. All right. Let's see. Well, Christian. OK. Do you have a mm. Yeah. OK. Just, just quickly on this last point, referring to Christopher's question. Uh, of course, Christopher, the very assumption you based your question in is that the world at least if you take a somewhat longer historic perspective, is uh, becoming a much better place. There is less conflict. You focused on conflict between states, but you know the under underlying assumption <coughs> is that. That is an assumption which does not at all resonate with the, the, the assumption that you read out of mainstream political debates at the current. The mainstream political debate is characterized by the conviction that the world is uh, falling apart uh, we are living in the worst crisis in recent history, uh, and we don't know what to do about it. Uh, I don't say I ascribe to that view. I actually think that that view is fairly poorly informed, uh, but it is the mainstream conviction that informs politics, not only in the West, but in much of the world at the moment. Read the Norwegian uh, foreign minister's recent presentation to the parliament, for example, about the state of affairs. And then the question is also, of course, for politicians, what do we do about it? And the sense is, at the moment, most instruments we have had at our disposal over the past uh, 20 years, uh, 25 years after the Cold War, are ineffective. Now we have to focus on damage control. You heard this come up around 2007, 2008, in the war of Afghanistan. It changed from rebuilding uh, a blossoming uh, democracy to Afghan good enough. Afghan good enough was the, good, was the going term. There's a, quite a bit of cultural relativism in that, of course. But uh, that, was, uh, that was the idea. And now I think there is a sense that the best we can do is to control the damage. And when Norway now turns from a rather proactive pronouncement of its peace and reconciliation policy and its work for global development, to working to help stabilize fragile states, it's an expression of the same. Now, of course, the policy pronouncement sounds much more radical than the actual change in policies will be. We all know that. But nonetheless, the discourse in itself is interesting. So what does that mean for the Nobel Peace Prize? Should the Nobel Peace Prize, in that sense, uh, shift its focus accordingly and start looking at who it is that has done the best work to con damage for damage control, or should it see its mission as uh, expressing <coughs> an entirely different and much more radical vision, which is really about demonstrating that there are other ways, not only of thinking about the world and what is possible, uh, but also acting in it. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, we, we, we might think that um, the years around 1900, when uh, Alfred Nobel wrote his testament, uh, was a period of uh, interstate war, and that he was basically preoccupied with interstate war. He was. 
But there was also a sort of blind spot in his, uh, in his will. And the blind spot, of course, was, uh, was all the colonial wars. This was at the high age of imperialism. It doesn't reflect in the Testament. It doesn't reflect on, on sort of his basic thinking about international affairs. Today, it's, uh, I, I agree completely. Yes, there are very few international wars. But there are quite a lot of domestic wars, quite a lot of, of, uh, of regional clusters, uh, with a mix of, of uh, domestic wars and with an international dimension. Um, th th there has been quite a lot since the end of the Cold War also, where, where, where this, is, this is sort of the basic type of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the new types of conflict. Uh, they are not new. They, they existed also in Nobel's times, but it was a blind spot in his, sort of in, his, in his view of the world at that time, because colonial wars and imperialism were sort of outside his, his, uh, his uh, basic framework. So I think that, that the, 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 uh, the uh, peace prize also has to reflect this, and it does to a very great extent. Uh, domestic wars uh, to try to sort of handle the, the, um, the, um, the um, Arab Spring, all these types of, of, of situations which is, not, which is not war in the classical sense. It's not sort of inter, uh, interstate war in the classical sense. It's, it's, it's handled and it has to be handled within the framework of, uh, of, of, of a peace prize for our times. And, and I think it does to, 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 a, fairly great, to a fairly great extent. Um, I also agree with, uh, with my Bente Bonnevi that, yes, there is a potential for large-scale war. It still is a great potential for large-scale war. Uh, due to, to the weapon situation, due to the, to the fact that major powers has atomic weapons, due to the tense situation between uh, last year we, we, discussed, uh, we discussed nuclear war. Uh, I, I, I remember that I chose, that I chose uh, the situation between India and Pakistan mm -hmm. as one of the sort of uh, very sort of crucial areas with atomic weapons on both sides. And, and, and that is also still the case, that there is a potential for large-scale war with, with this type of world we live in. So, so and, 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 and I think the, the Peace Prize should, should reflect also upon that. And, and drones, yes, it's a, it's a good point, because that is, that is part of this. But I mean, the, the emphasis, the kind of, I mean, if, if you say, you know, a key issue for peace or, is to regulate the way you fight wars, then the distinction between, oh, that's why. I, have, I haven't turned mm -hmm. it on. <laughs> you haven't turned it on. I haven't turned it on. Did you hear what I said when I was before? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't have space yet. <laughs> <laughs> Save time. But, but the emphasis, uh, if you say the way we fight wars, you know, if, if you say that we cannot abolish wars, so we have to focus on <coughs> controlling wars, then the next emphasis, then logically, is we have to control the means and the methods of warfare. Uh, and that applies to internal wars, to colonial wars, to international wars, to whatever. And uh, again, I, I thought when you said we live in peaceful times, I thought you were being ironic. Okay. Ulla. Yeah. Me too, actually. So uh, I think yeah. even if you are right that the numbers of interstate war is decreasing, uh, as long as there is one single interstate war going on, there is one too many. Uh, so for that reason, I think uh, the, the Nobel, Norwegian Nobel Committee will never become unemployed. If, if, if they take the uh, testament instructions in the testament seriously, they will never become unemployed because that is actually the fascinating <coughs> and impressive thing about the criteria of the Testament, that uh, it really covers most relevant peace issues of our time, so more than a century later. So I think uh, there, there, there will be always, always uh, a lot of, of potential for this prize. Uh, someone asked, what are the peace congresses today? Well, there are actually peace congresses being organized within the peace movement still. So th that is one example. Many people will argue, and I, I, I will uh, agree, that uh, the United Nations can be looked upon as a permanent peace congress of our time. The committee obviously regarded the Tunisian national dialogue process, not the quartet, but the process as a, a peace congress where parliamentarians 
civic society representatives came together for an extended period to write a new constitution for a country, written by conflict and threatened by civil war. And that served as a peace congress. So it's, it's, it's uh, no problem finding the parallels even today. The point about parliament. I said the, the key question is why a parliament? I, I still believe that, but you are right. Why a Norwegian parliament? Uh, and there have been many uh, theories about that. Uh, we, we don't really know, but probably it has to do with the fact that we were in a union with Sweden at the time, so it was natural for Alfred Nobel to think, I want to include the Norwegians as well. One of the prizes at least. And why then the Peace Prize? Well, probably you are right. He felt that the Norwegian parliament was better in some sense regarding peace and war topics than the Swedish. Uh, it was not aristocratic. Norway didn't have uh, the same war tradition as Sweden. But it is a mis and it was probably more democratic in this orientation. It was a strong super supporter of arbitration, which was an idea Alfred Nobel uh, liked. But it is a mistake to think that the Norwegian parliament at the time was more peaceful or more pacifist. Because Norway in the 18, 1890s had a very ambitious armament program. Norway moved from the year 1890 we were down at the bottom of military expenditure per uh, capita. At the end of the century, we were among the top five or six. Only the great powers spent more on defense than Norway. Why? Because the conflict with Sweden was increasing, and Norwegian politicians believed we needed a strong defense to deter Swedish aggression if the union breaks up. So at the, exactly at the time <coughs> Alfred Nobel wrote his will and decided to give this responsibility, this task to the Norwegian Storting, the Storting was engaged in rearmament, which is, I think, quite an interesting and important observation. Okay, I've been trying to keep track of hands going up in the order that they have gone up. I noticed Helga Faro, then the gentleman behind Helga Faro, and, I, we, we, and we need to take uh, one of our students, most definitely. You're a student? Okay, now, now, I'm, now I'm, I'm... Aren't we all? <laughs> we can take you then. Okay, so we've got three. And then but try to be very brief, because I know there are more questions leading in the, in, you know, behind. All right, uh, two points, basically. Yeah. Uh, one about the uh, makeup of the committee. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, it probably functioned better in the, uh, before World War II, when the liberals ran the show and basically decided who was to sit on the committee uh, in terms of high power intellect. And, but w with the Osietsky case, um, former prime ministers and foreign ministers could, were, should not, decided that they should not any longer sit on the committee. But clearly, membership in the committee I until 1940 was of a quite remarkable uh, high quality personnel. Um, I won't explicitly compare, but I think that's uh, the, the, the I think that way of selecting people in terms of getting the best conceivable committee members function better than the system now, which is based on uh, the uh, size of the parliamentary caucus. And secondly, I think we should keep in mind that there is. We don't really know what goes on in the committee. Uh, I mean, as advisors, we got fairly limited feedback. So all our constructions about tendencies is, is post hoc reasoning. Uh, the only ones who know exactly what goes on in the committee are committee members and the two, two directors. 
And as we witnessed last fall, there are limits to what the committee will accept that, that the director can, can say publicly. Um, so I think to the degree that we base our reconstructions on what the director says publicly, there is, it's evidence that probably we're not too far <coughs> off, but we don't know what they have discussed or whom they discussed who didn't get the prize. So and there, are a lot of, there, there are a lot of stuff going on within the committee that we will at best know 50 years later. Mm -hmm. Then we, uh, just behind. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Gerrit Kurtz. I'm a PhD student at King's College London and a new member of the research school. Good. Um, so uh, you said that um, the Peace Prize gives uh, a microphone to the laureates, of course, and that's something that uh, I would like to, to focus on uh, briefly, because now there's a, a whole community of, of Nobel laureates that, that even meet separately, that uh, you know, discuss uh, contemporary events and, and issues of, of War and Peace, issue statements and so on. Um, but that also creates attention, I'd say, um, because um, the prize um, is associated with such a high reputation. It's, it's probably the most important prize in the world. It might be true. Um, but some of the individuals um, that have been awarded the prize have had, to say the least, very problematic uh, roles in the past, or may ha may, may behave problematically in the future. I mean, think of, of Yasser Arafat in the PLO, think of Henry Kissinger. Um, I mean, when Barack Obama was awarded the prize, it wasn't at all sure what, what he would do. And I mean, if you look at the drone wall, you can still debate that. Um, so my question would be, should the Peace Prize only be given to people that subscribe to uh, certain set of norms, fundamental norms of human rights, democracy, rule of law, and peace? Um, or is it more important that they contributed to certain peace agreement or peace in the last year or, or in general to a specific issue? And to make it even more relevant, mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, there's a specific case that I would have in mind even that's coming up, perhaps, which is the Colombian peace process. Because mm -hmm. the parties are now very close to coming to an agreement. and well, after 50 years of war, I think you can debate that you know this would be worthy, generally, of, of a prize in that sense. But in terms of the norms, certainly not. So that would be an interesting issue to discuss. And we have, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for the nice talks. I'm, I'm quite surprised. I'm, I'm, my name is Mia Rosta. I'm also a new member of the research school. I'm from the Center of Conflict Resolution in uh, Copenhagen, the Center for Resolution of International Conflicts, actually, mm. University of Copenhagen. Um, I'm surprised to hear that two of you refer to a study from 2008 by a law professor in terms of uh, impact and, and the Nobel Peace Prize broadly. Others of you say it's my personal conviction that it has this and this impact. I'm quite surprised that it there aren't, and, and maybe that's my ignorance, but it seems extremely relevant also for for our research institutions to have much more emphasis on what is the impact, not to limit the scope of the visionary perspective and the, uh, the political strategic engagement, but to actually stay relevant, as, as Risurka was saying, because it's not just about making the choices about the, who is to be selected uh, among the nominees. It's also about how is this mechanism working in terms of how, how much emphasis on justifications. Now there's, an, as some of you were saying, an increased attention to this peace prize. Uh, how can that be used to stay relevant? How can the, the prize to Declerc and Mandela how could that be used to stay relevant in more systemic terms for Obama in more systemic terms on American political culture and engagement in the world as a political leader and uh, to emphasizing for the future that this is important. Also to maybe the relevance in terms of some of the issues that nobody raises. The, the, the increasing flaws of the peace building architecture uh, which few people races because they are normally within the system, the UN systems, the diplomatic systems, the whole system of development system that frames peace building today and which is 
rapidly disintegrating and becoming less effective in, in promoting peace. It's not a campaign, it's not a person, it's a system, but it's something that maybe there's a role for this peace prize to raise a voice and then in a way raising that voice to have systemic impact. Of course, with the limitations of, of what a peace prize can do. Thank you. Since time is, is almost up, I'd like to take two more questions. There was one over here. I, Stein, was it you or was it someone? Yes, I had a small comment. Yeah, OK. This is just a question to Olav about the uh, a suggestion from my younger brother, Eivin Tönnesson, which he made at the Atlanta. And I had never heard him made it before. And this is that when Alfred Nobel chose the Norwegian parliament, it had to do with the fact that Norway, the Norwegian parliament, did not have a foreign policy. So that, uh, that would, it would not risk being attached to national interests. So in a way, then, Norway would be disqualified since 1905. Thanks. And then I'll, uh, Henrik Sisa, who I believe is the only sitting uh, Nobel Committee member in the room. And I'm, I'm especially letting him speak because tomorrow's his birthday, though. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, and that's what I'm going to talk about as well. Um, <laughs> thank you to the panel. I was wondering if I should say anything, because there is admittedly a sort of weirdness to uh, me saying anything here, because uh, the uh, things we actually talk about in the committee do happen behind closed doors. So I won't comment on that at all. I won't even comment on last year's uh, prize, but just thank you very much for interesting things. It's strange to sit there and hear these sorts of debates. It's like Norwegian uh, <laughs> author Tadja Eves was one of the sort of meeting where they interpreted his poems, and he came away saying, is that what I wrote? <laughs> uh, I've just been on the committee for one year, so I don't have that much experience either. But I'd just like to say two things very briefly. First of all, the independence is real. I guess you all know that. But I'd just like to emphasize that once one is on the committee, <coughs> there is no dialogue with those who have actually nominated you. Uh, there is no discussion with politicians about where to go. I feel very strongly about that, and I can say that openly, because that's what is emphasized to me from the other members of the committee, former <coughs> president as well. More importantly, I'd just like to say one word of philosophy, that we talked about the difference between the other Nobel Prizes and the Peace Prize. But I'd like us to remember that they're all part of the same will. And they do say that these prizes should go to people who have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. In the Chemistry Prize, for instance, there is explicit talk about improvement. Uh, in an ideal way is what is said about the Literature Prize. And I think there is an underlying, arguably at least, assumption here about the existence of a common interest for humankind. And while that may sound like something trivial, I certainly believe it's not. I think it's the same idea that in many ways is expressed in the first line of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on inherent dignity of individual human beings. There is an idea here that somehow there is a benefit for humankind that exists. Knowing what that is and interpreting that is incredibly hard. But I think in our world, whether more or less peaceful, that that is an idea that the whole Nobel enterprise somehow should be conscious about. That somehow we are representatives of an idea of a world that should not splinter into pieces uh, in, in armed conflict, but that somehow should move ahead together. So that's all I'd like to say. Once again, thank you very much to Greg and all the panelists for a, uh, a great meeting. Thank you. Thanks. I think now, uh, to wrap up, I will uh, ask each panelist to make a closing statement, ideally in response to a question. I don't know that we're going to be able to cover all of the questions now. But please just come with your, your closing point. Mm. Olaf. Okay. Uh, first, very briefly to uh, Stein's uh, question. It's a very interesting uh, hypothesis. Unfortunately, we cannot know. I mean, we don't, cannot possibly decide whether that was part of his uh, thinking. It may have been. But then again, if he followed Norwegian <coughs> politics that closely, he would also know that it was a aspiration of many Norwegian parliamentarians that Norway should have its own foreign policy and that we worked in that direction and that that was a major cause of friction between Norway and Sweden. So um, I don't know. Uh, 
one very interesting question raised, uh, whether or how to deal with imperfect, imperfect uh, candidates. I mean, we are living in a world where no, no one or very few people are saints. So if you want to award someone working in the real world for their work, which has political importance, you must probably to some extent also accept the risk of awarding the prize to someone who is definitely not the saint. And that is, of course, a very dilemma, a huge dilemma sometimes, like the Kissinger Award. <coughs> You have bombed another country to the negotiation table, but the result may be peace. So how to decide what shall uh, matter the most? That's a very tough question, and uh, I would be surprised to put it that way. I would be surprised if the committee don't discuss those aspects. I would be surprised if the uh, consultants don't put those dilemmas on the table for the committee. Thank you. Let me pick up on the question of impact and systemic impact, which I think is, is very important. If we are to understand uh, how to get most peace benefits, so to speak, out of a particular price, in other words, what are the systemic effects uh, of a particular prize. Uh, how should we think about that? Um, and then we could at least, uh, two things or two aspects come immediately to mind. One is that if the prize is used to promote laws and norms regulating the use of military power, that clearly has, at least in theory, a systemic impact as opposed to giving to an individual that uh, worked in a particular case. Uh, but the other uh, impact, uh, which could also be systemic, is if you have, in a particular case, uh, a particular process or a particular message, so that the prize becomes a mirror that shows uh, the temper of the times. It can show a particular peace process, but it shows it as a mirror. And the function of a mirror, of course, is very important. Uh, I think you said that price is just, or it can be a, a mirror for the temper of the times. But that in itself is very important because a mirror shows the blemishes and it shows the good things. And it should encourage consciousness and reflection upon these processes. So a price that brings out in an important way the temper of the times or the, the nature of the peace process thus becomes a mirror or a prize that promotes the normative framework for the use of military power. I think both have systemic uh, mm -hmm. effects. So that's at least I could start thinking about impact in those ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, for, for, for those who work for peace in a more sort of long-term perspective, uh, to, to, sort of, to, to create the norms for peace, to, to work for peace within various areas of international politics, uh, you could say that, yes, the Peace Prize gives them a microphone. And this might be extremely important to sort of highlight this type of work. For those who get the prize for creating peace last year, uh, they, are, they, they don't need a microphone. Obama didn't need a microphone, or, or, or Kissinger, or, or, or Arafat, or whoever. Uh, but if you look at the history of the prize, they have tried to strike a balance between these two various types of work. Those who work on a more sort of long-term general basis uh, in, in, in some specific area, connected to peace, whatever that means, uh, at a specific time of history. And on the other hand, those who made, contributed to making peace last year. <laughs> it's a, that, that, that's the history of the prize. And, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really like to have a strong opinion on that. I, I think it is. I think they have, they have worked quite well if you, if you look a long time back. Uh, this, this, general, this general question of why Norway is, of course, interesting to us. Uh, and it should be, <laughs> because this is a very important price. There has been a debate about uh, whether the Norwegian Storting should elect foreigners to the price. 
Um, I argued publicly against that because I think that it would create an extremely complicated diplomatic tug of war. <laughs> Which ones? Which foreigners? Americans, Europeans, Russians? Who? Who should that be? It would create an extremely difficult diplomatic situation. And I think that would be, ah, no. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It would make this nearly impossible. Uh, it, is, it is bad as it is <laughs> with the composition of the committee. And it would make it even worse. Um, I, I thought about this question which, which Stein raised, raised because I had on my, on my, on my pad, I had, I, had, I had noted down Norway had no foreign policy. But again, uh, Norway tried for two or three decades to, um, to, to, to get away from Sweden to have a foreign policy. And it, was, and it was close to a war. It was at the brink of war between Norway and Sweden in the mid-1990s, 1995. And Nobel must have known this, that because Norway wanted an independent foreign policy, they came close to a war with Sweden. He might have been sympathetic to Norwegian independence. That's also a lot of speculation in this. Uh, we don't know. But it is, it is it's somewhat of a mystery. I, I, still, I still tend to think that it, the, the, the basic answer is probably it's a small country, uh, really harm, nearly harmless, um, not, not, not a very strong profile in international affairs, uh, close to Sweden, uh, and, 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 and that, that might be enough to explain this. Thanks. Uh, much more to bite into than one possibly can in a couple of minutes. So. Uh, fine remarks but let me first pick up on uh, on what Henrik said about the independence it's tempting of course to use the occasion to respond to Henrik because after he became a member of the committee he and I never get a chance to discuss the Nobel Peace Prize neither in public nor in private so it's a rare it's a rare opportunity uh, mm -hmm. and I um, entirely uh, I entirely agree with you that the committee as such operates independently. Uh, I think the best testimony to that is the 2010 prize, which stirred a huge controversy over independence, the prize to the Shabu, which of course uh, the Chinese thought was uh, under the instruction of the Norwegian government, whereas the real story is that in fact the committee did did exactly what it did, despite uh, rather stern warnings from the Norwegian government, being fully convinced that the consequences for Norway as a state would uh, be serious. Perhaps they didn't think it would, they would be as serious as they became, but they, the foreign minister at the time certainly was worried about the consequences, and we uh, know that he was worried with, uh, with good reason, but the committee chose to disregard that entirely and move ahead with what he thought was right. Now, there is another way in which independence can be affected, of course, and that is through the political mechanism of appointment. Uh, we do also know that when the 2012 prize was awarded to the EU, it was awarded in the year when the socialist left member on the committee uh, had fallen in and was on long-term sick leave, and that that proposition would not have been made in her presence. Now, that doesn't mean that she frequently consults with her party comrades about which prize to support or not, but it does mean that when she was appointed, she was appointed precisely because the party felt relatively safe that with her on the committee, at least there would be one voice that would oppose a peace prize to the EU. Uh, that is pretty clear. I think we, we, we know that. A um, uh, couple of other things. The ethical thing, uh, the prize shouldn't go to saints only, uh, is, a, is a very interesting one. And certainly there is, uh, there is uh, quite uh, a dilemma there for the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. I think the Colombia example that you bring up is a very interesting one and brings also to light the question of what sort of normative climate we are living in at the moment. Now, there was enormous debate about this back in the... Uh, uh, back in 94, when the Peace Prize to uh, Arafat, uh, Paris and Rabin was awarded, and the prize to Arafat in particular was heavily debated. And I sometimes wonder whether a prize of the same kind would have been possible today for several reasons. One is the whole discourse on, uh, on global terrorism, of course, which uh, has a very different temperature uh, and configuration today. But more importantly, the debate on transitional justice, justice for victims, uh, holding perpetrators accountable. 
Uh, that is a big discourse. I touched upon it in the context of talking about transitional justice as a possible candidate topic for a Nobel Peace Prize. But the climate is very, very different today. Uh, it's virtually unheard of. I mean, every peace mediator in the world now have a work description which explicitly prohibits them from in any way giving anything that amounts to a test to an amnesty or even an element of an amnesty. That was not the case in the mid-1990s. So we're living in a very different, uh, we're living in a very different time. I think, and I think you uh, indicated that you may sympathize with the same view that uh, the Colombian peace process would merit uh, a peace prize if it was successful this year. But of course, uh, um, even the current president, Dos Santos, is somebody who has bombed his way to the negotiation table. Not only has he profited from the fact that his predecessor, Uribe, bombed his way to the negotiation table, he has continued to use arms as an integral instrument of the very peace process that he is promoting. Likewise, we, uh, we can go to length to describe the atrocities committed by the FARC over many decades. We don't need to go into any detail, but of course it's, it's, highly, it's highly problematic. Then just a final comment on impact. Uh, Mia, was that the name? Yeah. Um, I entirely agree with you that it's a paradox that we can say so little about impact. But then there are also paradoxes when you start going after trying to capture impact, trying to measure impact. And one paradox which I would be worried about is the following. If the Nobel Peace Prize Committee sees it as its responsibility to make sure that every single prize has a measurable, demonstrable impact, not necessarily in the short term, even in the long term, then I think we would run the risk of the Nobel Committee becoming less daring and more myopic. If you give a prize to a process that is underway, entirely unpredictable, and you have some sort of agent, an organization or an individual that is willing to take that process a little step further, then it may be a relatively safe bet. But the Nobel Peace Prize is not going to make much of a difference. Now, if you use the prize to lift up the mission of somebody who is prom promoting something extremely daring, counterintuitive, earth-shattering, the likelihood that that person will actually achieve what he or she is after uh, is very slim. But the potential impact, if he or she is successful, are extremely worthwhile. So that, that is a real dilemma. It's a dilemma we face in research too. You know, it's uh, relatively easy to convince a policymaker to uh, add another sentence to a policy document, but to uh, actually reverse the very decision to take part in the intervention in Afghanistan and do something entirely different is much harder, but again, much more worthwhile. So I'm drawing from personal experience in my thinking here about Nobel Committee, but I'm, there is a risk that if we move to a strict sort of impact assessment regime, as the formal term would go, in our evaluation of the performance of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, we would actually get a Nobel Peace Prize with uh, a much less significant footprint than what we have had over the past decades. That's the dilemma. Okay, thanks very much. There were more questions that, that people wanted to raise. I'm sorry we didn't have time to take them all. But lunch will be served, and there's more opportunity for question raising and discussion uh, now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>